What's up, Church Online community? My name is Caleb, and I am so excited about today's online experience. As you're jumping on live, we want to hear from you. Send us a wave or drop an emoji in the comments to let us know you're here. Before we get started, we wanted to give you some tips for a better online experience. Number one, don't watch. That's right, we don't want you to watch this service. We want you to join this service. No matter who you are or where you're from, we believe God brought you here for a reason, and we want you to be part of creating and contributing to this online experience. Number two, minimize distractions. It's really easy to get distracted, whether it's someone walking outside, a notification on your phone, or one of your kids jumping on you. Do your best to minimize distractions because we believe that when we remove distractions, it allows our minds to focus on God and hear what His Spirit wants to say to our hearts. Number three, ask questions and take your next step. If you have questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the comments. We believe in next steps and we know that one small step toward God can change our lives forever. Maybe you wanna join a group, get involved serving, or make a decision to follow Jesus. No matter what your next step is, one of our chat hosts would love to connect with you and help you take that step. As we begin the service, focus your mind and heart on drawing near to God. Remember, it's never just another Sunday, never just another church service. We have the opportunity right now to allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts and change us from the inside out. Are you ready? Let's go. We worship the God who was we worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. But we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves we sing to the God who always makes a way Cause He hung up on that cross And He rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet Oh, we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet Oh, we shout out your praise We were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoners Now we're running free We are forgiven Accept it, redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise We were the beggars, now we're royalty We were the prisoners, now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise Oh, we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet Oh, we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet Oh, we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Oh, shout out your praise. We 
love to hear stories of how God is using this ministry to change lives. If this church has impacted your life, then share your story. Reach out to us on our website or message us on social media and let us know what God is doing. And a huge shout out to those of you who are partnering with us through online giving and recurring giving. Giving changes lives and you are making a difference every single day. If you would like to get started with online giving, simply click the link to partner with what God is doing through this church to change the world around us. Hey there, everyone. Welcome. Man, Terry and I are so thankful for your prayers and your faithful attendance while we vacationed. We enjoyed our time, but we certainly missed everyone and we're super glad to be back. And so here we are in November. In November, we bring you a financial series every year. And, and, and this message, this is number three of the series. The idea of this series is really to bless you and, and others through you. Most people, when they hear a preacher talk about finances, they think the church is just trying to get money from them. And that's not at all true. It's the furthest thing from the truth. We're going to get a blessing to you. And we're not trying to take something from you, but we'd rather we, um, you know, we have something for you through the Word of God. Um, I mean, let me just ask you this question. Do you want the blessing and favor uh, from, uh, from God on your money, on your finances? Of course you do. Me too. How does that happen? Well, by complete understanding and willingness to walk faithfully in the way of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because when you are blessed and favored, everyone around you knows it. They can see it. They can feel it. And guess what? God gets the glory. Here's the, here's the deal. Jesus died for you to have a life and have it abundantly. Now, don't be fooled by thinking that means you get a bunch of stuff. We're called to give more than we are called to receive. And there is a heart of generous love behind that idea. Scripture tells us that whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And today, we are in the third message of, of this series. And this message is entitled, Sowing and Reaping. Now, our prayer is that the Word of God is going to transform each and every one of us for His glory. And this is how we're going to do it. Number one, we're going to lean in. We're going to listen for ourselves. We're going to make this time personal. Number two, we're not going to listen through the lens of our past hurts or mistakes we're going to listen for what God has to say. We're going to embrace Jesus. And when we do that, we're going to experience hope for tomorrow. Number three, we're going to listen with a humble heart. Because if we listen in humility, you will discover that God is for you and his word is good for you. So let's, let's do that. Let's take one step closer to Jesus right now. Okay, so right out of the gate, I need to confess something to you. I did not always understand the spirit of generosity. Once upon a time, I, I was a lover of receiving 
rather than giving. I just thought I would never have enough to give. But I would also be remiss if I didn't confess to you that many people in my life were blessing me and sowing into me at, at a great rate. I was, I had the spiritual gift of being a tightwad, if you know what I mean. And, and, and that attitude of holding on to what I had, well, it, it corrupted my ability to receive the generous gifts, uh, you know, in, in humility. I mean, I was convinced that my, you know, I was convinced that I'm special, you know, I deserve this generous, you know, this, this generosity I poured upon me, right? I'm worth it. You know, that's where my mind was. Money was an obstacle for me. That, that's what I'm saying. I wanted God's favor in all of my life. But when it came to the money thing, I was a screech. Yes, God, I, I, will, I will serve you, but I'm going to need some money. <laughs> Blessed and highly favored. It just wasn't showing up on my bank account statement. You know what I mean? Well, I don't know. Maybe you can you know, relate. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but God spoke to me plainly. And quite frankly, you are limited in the area of finances because you just don't trust me. That's what God was telling me. You're limited in your finances because you don't trust me. I'm like, what? I totally trust you, God. But God said to me, he says, but do what I have instructed and I will take care of you. That's pretty powerful, right? You see, God was revealing to me in a very direct way that I valued my ability, my understanding, my skills, my priorities uh, to steward finances better than he could. That's essentially what I was doing. I wasn't saying it, but it's how I was living. It's pretty shameful, right? That's my story. Look, I think I'm a pretty generous person, but it really doesn't matter what I think of myself. All that really matters is what God thinks about me. And, and he has great plans for me. And part of that is to be generous in word and deed. And the good news is that God you know, worked it out divinely. He worked a new thing in my heart and it helped me to learn how to be more generous. One of the core values that we live by uh, here is generosity. Terry and I live with that generous spirit, an ir irrational giving. Uh, I, it truly is more blessed to, to give than it is to receive. Now, I know this topic of finances. Many folks struggle with listening to a message like this, but stay with me. It's one that they would rather avoid, but stay with me. And I get it. There's several reasons you don't want to hear a message like this, but perhaps maybe because you've been in church circles where ministers would teach on the subject of finances with a prosperity angle. Now, unfortunately, those manipulative methods, they stick in our heads and can limit our understanding as to what God truly wants for us. I mean, let me ask you a question. When you heard the title of this message, Sowing and Reaping, what, what were your first thoughts? Uh, right? Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to sowing and reaping, most folks have a tendency to, to lean more toward you get what you deserve you know, type of thought as opposed to generosity. Like you reap what you sow. There you go. And we think about sin. And if people are sinful and hurtful, uh, they're doing us wrong. They're going to get it. They're going to get it. It comes around, goes around kind of thing. And I, I mean, sowing and reaping when it comes to living is okay. We like that, right? If you sow sin, sinful seeds, then you're going to have a painful harvest. But as a reference of giving, as a, as a reference of generosity, oh boy, when we start talking about that, somebody's going to be challenged. Now, here's the deal. The principles of sowing and reaping is incredibly biblical. So I'm hopeful that many of us will be blessed today. I'm, I'm hopeful that you listening today will receive this blessing through the Word of God. Okay, so here we go. Discovery point number one is this. What you keep is all that you will have, but what you give, God will multiply. What you keep is all that you will have, but what you give, God will multiply. Jesus taught it this way in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We will pour into your lap. For the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Again, that's Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Now, what you keep is all that you'll have, but what you give, God multiplies. So this first part of, of the scripture, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We can grasp that, right? Give and it will be given to you. But the rest is not so clear. Maybe what, what is good measure? What is pressed down? What is shaken together? Sounds like some kind of cocktail that James Bond would order. 
I, I don't know. Let's unpack it. So it's really interesting. When Jesus taught um, this message, now when he, when he talked and he spoke, you got to understand in the context into which he was speaking to folks, most folks that he would be teaching would, would understand agricultural terms, right? They were farmers. They knew what farming was all about, so they would get analogies like that. So here's the deal. In Jesus' day, many landowners paid their workers in what they would be harvesting. For instance, if, they were, if the landowner was harvesting wheat, the workers would go out, right, and they would um, harvest the fields, all week, they would fill up baskets, and then they would put those baskets in storage so that they could be taken to market to be sold. Now, wheat is heavy when it's placed in baskets piled together, and so these baskets that were going to storage to be sold, they might get filled about halfway, three-quarters way, you know, depending on the strength of the worker. And honestly, the time of the day, as the day wore on, the it was that basket was getting heavier and heavier. But then at the end of the week, the landowner would pay the worker in a basket of wheat. He would say, hey, this basket is for you, Mr. Worker. So gather up all the wheat that you can place in it, and then you can take that with you. Now, let me ask you a question. How much wheat do you think got into that basket? How filled was that basket? Yeah, that basket was shaken. It was pressed down, right? And they poured as much wheat as they could fit into that basket to take home for their own needs. And since we may not understand farming terms, I want to put it into terms that all of us will understand. I want you to think Slurpee. When you pour uh, some of that Slurpee into your cup, right, you tap it down on the counter to make sure it gets packed down real good. And then you put that lid on top of it and it kind of reaches the lid and oozes over. You probably, some of you, probably some of you, put a straw and sip it a little bit just so it goes loud and you tap it again, right? Now, I would never do that, but some of you probably do. Are you getting this? Look, when you give, this is how God gives back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be given unto you. That's pretty amazing, right? If you give with that heart, right, that's what God's going to do. So if you keep what you have, right, then that's all that you're going to have. But God, what you give away, God will multiply. Now, in the church world, we see two erroneous teachings, primarily, that can swing in dangerous extremes. Prosperity and poverty gospels. Prosperity gospels, if you have enough faith, you can name it, you can claim it, right? So 100s, you're going to get thousands, right? Because the righteous are rich. God blesses those who are righteous. The poverty gospel is opposite of that. It says that if you're rich, then you're unrighteous. The righteous people are the poor people who give everything away or, or don't have anything at all. And here's the deal. Both of those are, are wrong. They're dangerously wrong. Scripture actually says that God blesses people. And sometimes he blesses them with health. And sometimes he blesses them in relationships. And sometimes he blesses people with wealth. It's, it's a blessing, one of, of many blessings from God. Scripture actually says God does bless people with wealth. And guess what? There are people that, that God has gifted with the spiritual gift of giving, with that spirit of generosity. So it's not about what you have or what you don't have as much as it is about the condition of your heart and how you manage what God gives you. Now, I want to examine this a bit further, shall we? There's, there's, there's some fundamental principles about sowing and reaping, right? Here's, here's two foundational principles about sowing and reaping. Number one is you reap what you sow. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. It's from Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. And what that man means is a man reaps what he sows. In other words, plant an apple seed, you're going to reap apples. Not oranges, not grapes, but apples. Smile at people, chances are they're going to smile back, right? You smile at people, chances are you're going to reap a smile. Forgive someone when they've wronged you, they're more likely to forgive you back when you've wronged them. Treat your wife with kindness, tenderness, love, and respect. She's more likely to do the same for you. You treat her poorly with a hard time, she's going to multiply that. She's going to give you hell. And all the ladies said, a good amen. <laughs> Why? Because you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Now listen, principle number uh, two, you reap more than what you sow. 
Yes, that's, that's correct. Listen to me. In God's economy, you reap more than what you sow. Not only do you reap what you sow, but you reap more than what you sow. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verses 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. They will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. In other words, if you give up something for the glory of God eternally, you will, re you will reap way more than what you gave. What you keep is all you have, but what you give, God multiplies. Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 13 to help us understand the principles of sowing and reaping. This parable was about a sower who went out and sowed some seeds. And the sower cast seed on different kinds of ground. Some of the ground returned a harvest that was 30 times what was planted. A better ground returned a, 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 a harvest that was 60 times what was planted. And the best soil actually returned a 100 times what was planted. You reap what you sow and you reap more than what you sow in God's economy. Now, Let's look at three giving truths right out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. So turn to your copy of the Word of God and follow along. There's three discovery points I think that we need to learn, learn from. Your heart matters when you give. Your heart matters when you give. And Paul said it this way. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What kind of giver does God love? A, that's right, a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Remember last week, Pastor Robert, um, he, he said that he considers it fun to give. He enjoys it. And you could really tell that he enjoys the gift of giving. He's got that gift and he gives. Not just out of obedience where he gives the tithe, but God has given him that gift to, to give outside, above and beyond. That's where the blessing is. Unfortunately, not everyone you know, experiences the fun yet. There's a story about a young girl and her mom that was trying to teach her the principle of giving. Mom has a $1 bill. She has a $5 bill. And she says to her daughter, here's a $1 bill and here's a $5 bill. One of these is for you and one of them is for God. Now you decide which one it is. Well, on Sunday, the pastor says God loves a cheerful giver. And then the offering plate comes by and the little girl, she's wrestling. Do I give one or do I give five? A one or a five? What do I do? What do I do? And she decided to put the $1 bill into the offering plate and she put the $5 bill in her pocket. And afterwards, the mom was asking her, so what was going through your mind when you did that? And the little girl said, well, the pastor said, God loves a cheerful giver. And I thought, well, I'd be a lot happier with a $5 bill in my pocket. So I gave God the one. Tongue in cheek, that's funny, right? But, but really being honest, <laughs> let's call it what it is. That's what a lot of us actually believe. That's what we practice. We'd be happier if we just keep what we have. And the reason I know that is because that's exactly what my heart was for years. I didn't realize the joy of generosity. I didn't understand that prior to giving the tithe, my money's cursed, but above and beyond the tithe, God, it's already blessed it. I love that. To get through this, I was instructed to give and give and give. Why? Give till I loved it. And really, it's, it's become a core value of ours. We actually choose to live moderately <laughs> so that we can give more. Because others have done this for us. And our Lord gives us the most generous example of all by giving his son. I have countless stories. I've heard countless stories over and over. People have, who have found joy in giving. They're blessed beyond words when they give and see the joy and see God to get the glory. But I've never heard an emotional story from anyone that would say, hey, we were thinking about helping out somebody. We were thinking about giving a gift to somebody that we knew was in need. But you know what? The last minute, we just decided to keep it for ourselves. Wow, we feel so blessed. Nobody's ever said that to me. No one's ever said, well, you know, I'm so glad that I don't give to the church this year. And, and now I know those kids and their moms won't have a Christmas this year. It feels so good. I've never heard anybody say that. 
listen to me. There's a special joy in giving that never shows up in keeping. There's a joy in, in giving. There's no joy in keeping. The second thing is this. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. And, and, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their, unrighteous, their righteous endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for, for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, that's verses 8 and 10. And I love this. God will increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, when he blesses you, it won't just be with money, but he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God is not going to pour through somebody who is not spreading the seed of the gospel. Can I just say there are two times when you are most like God, when you are giving and when you are forgiving, when you are giving and you are forgiving, you are incredibly like God and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Listen to me, folks. You cannot outgive God and your heart matters when you give. You cannot outgive God and your heart matters when you give. Now, think about this. Number three, people will thank God because of what you give. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And that's the last verse of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Listen to me. You can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Imagine people lifting their hands and thanking God because of you. Imagine people worshiping God because God used you to meet a need in their life. Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let me remind you that many lives are changed because of your giving through Hope Center Suffolk. And by the way, thank you for your faithfully praying and giving generously with your resources. It is happening now, folks. God has opened these doors for those women in need. Look, lives, homes, communities will be transformed in the name of Jesus because of the compassion birthed in those of you willing to faithfully persevere. And missions in our country and around the world because of your giving, which include widows and orphans and indigent and impoverished outreach uh, into neighborhoods, uh, um, benevolence offerings and those uh, churches being uh, um, uh, birthed all around uh, the globe. It's all made possible because of your giving. So thank you and thank the Lord for all that's being done. God can take a little and do so much. Will you pray with me? Father, we pray that your spirit would speak to your church today and God, that we would live a life that reflects your heart of generosity because you loved us so much. You loved us and the world so much that you gave. You gave your one and only son. And God, I pray that, that out of that reflection, the most generous, compassionate, unconditional, loving heart in the world, God, that you would reflect your love, that we would reflect your love and the world would know that we belong to you as they see us love with your unconditional generosity. Now, if I was to ask you of a show of hands, how many of you would like to live with the blessing and favor of God? You put your hands up, wouldn't you? But we all need to understand that the blessing and favor of God starts at the foot of the cross. Now, perhaps you're ready to receive this gift of everlasting life. Perhaps you realize that you've been going your own way. You've been doing your own thing, that you haven't been living for God. You had no regard to what God wants or, or care about what God has prepared for you. Well, you can change that today. Listen to me. 
We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But even so, Scripture tells us that while we were disobedient, while we were doing our own thing, while we were still sinning, while we were shaking our fist at God angrily, God sent His one and only Son to come into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world from the penalty of death. Our sin deserves the penalty of death. But you can confess today believing the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross, that his sacrifice pays for the penalty of your sin. And you can believe that Jesus did not remain dead. And as promised, he rose from the grave and he invites you to join him in eternity. Will you choose Jesus today? You can pray a prayer like this. Just pray it from your heart to his. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, who suffered and died for my sins. I ask you, Jesus, to be my Savior, my Lord, and my King. And I know you were thinking of me when you died on that cross. So from this day forward, I will live for you. Amen. Seal it with an amen. Hey, listen to me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you've recommitted your life to Christ today, please let us know. We have a gift we want to get to you. Now, let's all go do the great things that God has called us to. Blood of Jesus.
Thanks again for joining us today. It is our hope that this community would be a place where we can encourage one another to be more devoted followers of Jesus Christ and to share his hope and love with the world around us. If you would like to experience the hope and love that is found in a personal relationship with Jesus, let us know by simply typing Jesus in the comments. Or maybe you're ready to get baptized, join a group, or get involved serving. No matter what your next step is, we are here to connect with you and help you pursue a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. We pray that the Holy Spirit would make the Word of God come alive to you this week and that His presence would be with you no matter where you go. We encourage you to stay up to date with this community by visiting our website or following us on any of our social media platforms. Have a great week.